Well, I work at Intel, have been working at Intel for over 20 years. That's why I have all this gray hair. And every talk at Intel, we have to go through and talk about Moore's Law. Gordon Moore came up with this law back in the 60s based on just a few data points and he extrapolated out into the future and said that basically every, oh, every couple years or so, the number of transistors on a device that Intel could market would double. The amazing thing is that here we are many, many years later, more than 40 years later, and Moore's Law is still cranking along. We're still, you know, roughly on that pace, doubling the number of transistors. Now, what this has turned into over time is very interesting, because what's happened is, is we've used all those transistors to give you more and more performance. And you can see in this graphic right here that we're plotting performance roughly over time. And you can see we're on this nice, straight, cool line showing that the performance indeed is, is doubling right along with the number of transistors. So that's really, really cool. The result of this is very interesting sociologically. So what has happened is, is that we've trained people to expect that performance comes from hardware. You write your software any which way you want, and we will go through and, and do the magic of hardware, and we'll make it run fast. So optimization becomes leave it to the hardware, and everything will work really well. The result is, is generations of programmers have been trained to not really think very much about performance, to just leave that to the hardware. It's led to things with languages like Java, which Java's a nice language. There's a lot to love about it, but it was not designed for performance. In fact, that virtual machine hides your ability to really even get at the low-level performance effectively. And that's okay, because hardware gives you the performance. Something happened. What happened was power. <laughs> All of a sudden, we had to start thinking about power. Now, on this graphic right here, this is a beautiful study done by Ed Grachowski of Intel. What he did is he plotted the power versus the performance, and he normalized it to process technology. So you're seeing the impact in this picture of different architectural features. And what you can see is as the performance goes up, the power is actually rapidly shooting up. It's not quite a quadratic, it's 1.74, pretty darn near quadratic, and basically a completely unsustainable power model as we went from the Pentium Pro up to the Pentium 4. So this is unsustainable. We hit, this is when you hear people talk about the power wall, this is what they're talking about. So what happened is we went through and we radically redesigned and optimized the architecture for power. So I show a data point here on the Pentium M, which is already several years old right now. But basically the current architectures we're coming up with, we reduced the number of pipeline stages. We simplified it so that the architecture gives us a lower power point. That's really, really important. It means though that uh, the performance profile is a little bit different, but if you're designing around power optimization, not performance at any power, you have these different architectural design points. Doesn't take us far enough though. We have to get even more aggressive on how we deal with power and performance. And now we bring in some cool math. And this is an equation that tells you about for a given throughput through a chip, for a given frequency, how does the power scale? Now, the way we do this is we first look at the standard capacitance, which talks about the ability of a circuit to store energy. So capacitance is equal to the charge that a circuit holds divided by its voltage. Or charge, which is, we use the letter Q, equals capacitance times voltage. Now, we know that work is moving a charge against a voltage. So work is voltage times charge. Well, I put those two together, and I get work equals capacitance times voltage squared. Now, what is, how do I go from work to power? Well, power is work per unit time, right? So work per unit time means that the uh, work times the frequency, because frequency is one over time, is gonna give me the power. You put that all together, I get that the power is equal to the capacitance times the voltage squared times the frequency. Remember that equation, because that's very important as we understand what is happening in computer architecture today. So now, this very important picture here that we have up gives you a comparison between two architectures. In one, I'm driving some input through a chip with some output at frequency F and a given power. All right, now the other architecture, I take two cores, which are on the same chip, but I'm driving them at half the frequency. 
Now, because I have more wires, I didn't just double the capacitance. I had a little bit more than double the capacitance. Frequency scales with voltage, but you know, there's leakage, there's other stuff going on. So let's say the voltage goes not half, let's say it goes to 0.6. I then plug it into that equation that we derived before, and what we find is the power goes down in this half frequency case 40%. Now, think about what that means. I am getting throughput the same number of outputs in these two circuits, okay? For a given input at F with one core versus F over two with two cores, I'm getting the same output. But with the two cores, I'm getting 40% of the power. This is why, whether you like it or not, parallel computing is with us to stay because it gives us the ability to get the same amount of work done with multiple cores at a lower frequency at a tremendous power savings. And this is why if you look across the industry, not just at Intel, but if you look at across the industry from our competitors at AMD and Nvidia and IBM and even the ARM world, you look at the Xeon Phi with uh, 60 cores, you look at Xeon with four cores, eight cores, you look at our research chip with 48 cores, look, the, the fact of the matter is, all of us across the industry are putting more and more cores on a piece of silicon. So this has led to a very interesting and radically different dynamic that all of you need to be very, very much aware of. If you take this architectural change towards simpler architectures, where we're not using all those, all those transistors to give you insane performance, if you couple that with the fact that we're going to be putting lots of cores on a piece of silicon, we now have a new contract between hardware and software developers. Now what we're saying is hardware people will do whatever the heck they feel like, and software people will have to deal with it. Performance comes from software. Performance doesn't come from hardware. Or as Herb Sutter so famously said in his article uh, from Microsoft, um, the free lunch is over. We in the software world just can't sit on our butts and let performance go to hardware. We're gonna have to do it ourselves. And what does that mean? It means parallel computing. It means you're gonna have to go into your software and make it run in parallel. Now, let me just say right off the bat that after two or three decades of research, automatic parallelism has utterly failed time and time again. So I'm sorry, we are not gonna be able to create a magical compiler that takes your serial code and creates parallel code for you. Ain't gonna happen, don't waste your time. You're gonna to have to roll up your sleeves and you're gonna to have to parallelize it yourself.